Hi, this is Rachel and Cover. We are back with Dr. Stacy Shore, and she's going to tell the rest of her story. Most definitely. Um, tell us a little bit about new neurons in adults. Well, that's the cells I was talking about. I mean, we, we have lots of neurogenesis when we're developing in the fetus, um, obviously, because the cells are just exploding, really, in terms of their uh, pr production. Um, but in the adult, like I said, there's not that many. Um, they do tend to be in the hippocampus, olfactory bulb, maybe a few other places. Um, you know, it's kind of hard to study them in, in humans. There have been some studies, for example, showing, though, that people who are um, depressed, severely depressed over a long period of time, actually have many fewer of these cells. They're also really sensitive to alcohol. So drinking alcohol produces fewer of these cells. And if you look at the brains of people who are uh, addicted to alcohol, been drinking a lot of alcohol, there's fewer of these new neurons. So most things that we think of as bad for us <laughs> are actually bad for these cells, including stress and trauma. So for whatever reason, the, the, the mechanisms that are engaged when we're suffering with, through a lot of stress and trauma uh, impacts the production of these neurons. I can see that. Um. Yeah. yeah, interesting. And it's, it's also, um, you know, not to be too negative, because there's also things we can do to, to enhance the production. For example, exercise, like aerobic exercise is great for making more of these cells. Like I said, learning, learning is really good for keeping the cells alive. So <laughs> it's not hope. It's not hopeless. <laughs> we can make more. And that's kind of cool if you think about it, that you could make more neurons in your brain just by Most definitely. What you do. All right. Um, tell us about the hippocampus and how it relates to PTSD and CPTSD. Yeah, so... Most of the studies in humans on this, you know, years ago were ha had to be done post-mortem, meaning someone would die and then they would donate their brain to, to science. And then, you know, they would look at the brain and see if there were any changes. And so those studies were few and far between. Um, and you can imagine just lots of things happen between when someone dies and when their brain makes it to some laboratory. So we don't really know that much about how complex trauma or even just trauma itself could affect the human brain until brain imaging came on the scene. And, you know, that uh, technology has really, really developed a lot in the last 10 or 20 years much more than I would have even imagined. And so as a consequence, we do know quite a bit more about it. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's like one thing we can know because again, it's super dynamic, the brain. And we do know that there's certain networks that are really engaged when people are traumatized, have been traumatized. Um, you know, kind of talking a little bit about rumination even. Like we know that, People who have experienced a lot of trauma ruminate, and there are certain networks in our brain that become engaged as we're ruminating. And engaging in those networks prevents us from using other networks that we might rather use to learn something or to propel okay. ourselves forward. Um, so it's, a, it's kind of a dynamic thing. I can say, though that there are quite a few studies now suggesting that people with, particularly with depression, and some with, with PTSD, that, that the hippocampus, for example, um, might even be smaller. So, you know, there's some controversy about it. It's not, it's not like you could measure someone's hippocampus and tell whether or not they have PTSD. I don't want to apply that at all, but you can 
imagine that you know long term suffering with symptoms of PTSD and depression definitely has an impact on on the structure, the actual anatomical structure and size of our brain, and, and in particular the hippocampus. Oh. Oh, most definitely. Um, yeah. What are some of the more most accepted forms of therapy for trauma? Um, yeah, so people have been seeking help for trauma forever, at least as long as we have recorded history. And as you, I'm sure, know, there's just many different types of therapy that have been tried and so in, in academic science, you know, we, we usually talk about evidence-based therapies. That means, you know, therapies that have been really tested out in the world, usually through randomized clinical trials, meaning that nobody kind of knows what, what they're in, what groups are in therapy, um, to be a little more objective. And the two types of therapy that have emerged to be really useful for trauma are prolonged exposure therapy. It's often referred to as PET and cognitive processing therapy, CPT. And both of these therapies emerged from CBT, which is cogn means cognitive behavioral therapy. And you know, those therapies focus on thoughts. How do we change our thoughts? And again, you know, because our thoughts are attached to our memories and our feelings, if we could just change those thoughts, especially if they're irrational or causing us lots of suffering, then maybe we can also change the feelings. And so both of those therapies kind of focus on that. Exposure therapy, prolonged exposure therapy, has someone... The person, the, the client is exposed to the memory over and over and over again until the memory kind of loses its attachment to the feeling in our body. You know, so for example, if someone was <clears throat> uh, exposed to um, a violent attack on a street by, you know, a strange man then they might be exposed first to the memory, just talk about it, write about it. Um, they would tell the story over and over again until it kind of loses some of its emotional content. And even in some circumstances, they might even start to like visit it or maybe see pictures of the street. Or And what the brain is doing during these exposures is it's learning, oh, wait, this bad thing happened to me in the past, caused lots of suffering, lots of fe horrible feelings in my body. But your brain is learning it isn't happening now. You know, that, that experience is in the past. This new memory is being made that says, oh, I can walk down a street and not be afraid, even if it's dark and even if it's, you know, the same street where I was attacked. So it's a form of learning. It's learning something new on top of what you learned, you know, during the trauma. And it's very effective. The only problem is it's, you know, it's kind of hard. Like people don't want to necessarily revisit all these memories, much less re actually revisit them. And so a lot of people don't stick it out. You know, it's called prolonged because you need to do it a lot of times. And Unfortunately, it's hard and people don't necessarily want to. Or want to can't afford to. Out. Or can't afford to. Good point. You know, it's all these things are expensive, too. And that's another pro problem kind of with our, our approach. Um, cognitive processing therapy is kind of similar. Like if you look at the protocol for it, it's not that different. But it focuses a little bit more or quite a bit more on the beliefs. You know, the beliefs and that accompany trauma. Because it's not necessarily just the trauma that's traumatizing, the experience itself. It's the belief you have about it. Like, 
maybe regret or shame or, um, yeah, like a lot of those beliefs, like, oh, if I hadn't been going down that street, then this would have never happened. And if I could just re- go back and relive it, I could be totally different. And those are, you know, not necessarily not true, but they need to be, the beliefs need to be um, paid attention to because that's oftentimes what keeps people in the past. Well, and there's all kinds of therapy that can be helpful. I know the newest ones that are out are relationship and like emotional therapy. Um, um, Yeah. And they're all a little bit different. And I know even for BPD, they usually use DBT. So. Yeah, DBT is also like um, dialectical behavioral therapy. You know, it has um, a little bit of meditation, mindfulness in it, which is kind of, was one of the first really kind of cognitive therapies that incorporated mindfulness into the, into the process. Um, now a lot of them do. But back in, you know, 20 years ago, that was kind of unique. And I think it really opened up a lot of doors for people. You know, my, my feeling about therapy, uh, and I'm not a therapist, but I'm, I am in a psychologist and I know a lot about these therapies, is that people need to find what, what helps them or what they feel comfortable doing. Maybe not comfortable might not be the right word because they're all going to be you know, could be traumatizing just having to think about what happened, but, you know, kind of what suits your person. And so some people gravitate more towards exposure therapy. Others might more to kind of body centered therapies. And um, yeah, there's a lot out there. And even just talk therapy is in, and talking to a counselor or a social worker, those are really helpful for group therapy. You know, some sometimes, yes, yeah, group, group therapy. therapy can be great. Um, I don't find it super helpful when dealing with PTSD. And I feel like you almost yeah. trigger each other and, um, and you, it's just, yeah. it can be, it can be good, but it has to be very small group and it has to have really good, uh, people managing the group group leaders yeah yeah a really good point i mean it's used i i I did some work at a residential treatment center for homeless women these women um were homeless out on the streets of new jersey they were mothers so they have young babies and children who were traumatized as well or often taken away from them and and they had addiction issues, so lots, lots of different types of trauma. You can imagine the, the trauma that happened while they were out on the streets. And um, so then they were in this residential treatment center where I worked for a while, and um, they had a lot of group therapy, you know, partly because it's, it's more accessible and it's cheaper to deliver. You know, so a lot of places really can't afford to have, like, one-on-one therapy for each person, so they... They, um, that's where kind of group therapy comes in. But, but you're right. It's, it can be definitely difficult to hear everyone's story. Yeah, I think, I think it's good in some situations. Um, but I feel like you have to have a good, um, good leadership leading the group and it can be very, very, yeah, Yeah. it can be very triggering. And that's probably, and that's true for any kind of therapy or anything really in life, right? It's kind of depends on the person who's doing it. So even if you, you know, were able to afford and go through like some of these therapies, it's mostly like the person who's helping you lead you. And, you know, are they really well skilled to do that and sensitive and all those things, compassionate? Well, and experience. I think there's, you know, I went on a retreat for, uh, sexual assault survivors and it was so triggering and it was just such a terrible experience I felt awful the entire time oh, no. I was there oh that's so wonderful but I also had gone to a you know the unique foundation has a retreat for survivors of childhood sexual abuse and it was well organized small groups 
And so everything went really well. So you feel like it's the size of the group? Is well, the big size factor? and, you know, I the, the other one was ran by, you know, a survivor, you know, I don't think had worked through all her trauma. And mm. the other one was ran by, you know, this family that, you know, is like, we need to reach out to, you know, these victims of childhood sexual abuse. And this is how they do it. Because, I mean, it's a, it's a free week. All you have to do is pay for your transportation. And you spend a whole, like, four days at this retreat. And they... Wow. That's the one that helped, that you thought was good and helped you... Was it kind of immediate? Like you knew during the process that it was helpful or was it like maybe like also, um, also I mean, I think both. Um, they were, it was very well done. It was very professional. And the other one, I felt like they had some good things, but they had a long way to go. And yeah. I feel like there was just so much more they could have done. Um, but they just didn't have the experience and they were not healed enough to help. And, uh, I, um, uh, I talked to a couple of people who've done recovery and they're like, yeah, you have to be in a certain place after recovery to help others because otherwise you're just a mess and it, it'll end badly. Yeah. Yeah. I've definitely been hearing that, you know, even, um, Therapists, you know, they have, they become, can also become kind of traumatized just from being, oh, yeah, hearing so much trauma. Secondary then, trauma is yeah. incredibly real. Yeah. One of my uh, colleagues, we, we did this study on sexual violence. Um, we've done several, but one of them was at the university with college women. And, you know, so she was doing the interviews for the PTSD diagnosis. And, you know, if you know about structured interviews, they go into a lot of detail, they ask lots of questions about what happened and exactly what happened and where and how did it make you feel, et cetera, et cetera. And I felt like for her, you know, listening to those stories day after day started to really, yeah, it started to really affect her ability to even. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can ask any expert. Dan Allen or Diane Lamberg, um, you know, they specialize in childhood sexual abuse and they'll tell you straight up the stuff will kill you, you know, if you don't take care of yourself. Yeah. Because you are taking on somebody else's trauma. And Diane Lamberg even talks about waking up with nightmares, you know, just hearing about these stories. No, I was kind of curious, like, just to ask you a question. You know, I just wrote this book about trauma, and one of the things I tried to do or tried not to do was tell too many stories. You know, I felt there were a lot of books out there about. Stories. Oh yes, most definitely. So I think kind of most of them focus on on that, and that's fine. You know, but I just, but I was wondering, like, how, and I, I so I've been reading some people's responses to some books and they're like, yeah, I don't, I don't really want to hear everyone's story. It's too, you know, it's triggering sometimes, even though it might be relevant or interesting, but it's well, especially helping. for empaths. Cause we soak all that up as somebody yeah. who is a recovering yeah. empath and still in progress. Um, we soak up all that emotion and it wears us out. Um, yeah, I think somebody yeah. was doing like a TED talk on it and they talked about like they had all these Gen Xers, not Gen Xers, um, not millennials. It was, yeah, I guess, um, yes. Anyways, so this particular like, yeah. generation that was struggling because they're like, I'm working, you know, they're working hours and they're like, I'm exhausted. I can't do this. And they were all empaths. And so wow. when you're in this type of work and you're an empath, you've got to distance yourself. 
And you've got to not, you know, you've got to set boundaries, whether it, you know, depending on how you're working with it. I mean, even I have to. I mean, I think I had three interviews in one day and I was just exhausted. I just want, you know, I, I think I ended up with a migraine at the end of the bit. And I was just like, I can't do this. And so, I can imagine. Um, you know, I try to, you know, two a week and try not to schedule them on the same day. And that's kind of my max. If I do two interviews in one day, that's all I can handle. Yeah. So just knowing your limits on that, because I mean, unfortunately it it's very difficult to separate yourself sometimes from that. Yeah. I noticed like even with the me too movement, which was, you know, amazing and, and I'm glad it happened that people became more aware of the prevalence of sexual trauma and people were able to, you know, talk about it more freely and, and, and get help. Um, but I did also hear from a lot of primarily women who I work with that, you know, they didn't necessarily want to talk about it or have to, yeah, they didn't want to relive it over and over again. And they felt to some extent, not necessarily obligated to do that, but, you know, there was just more, uh, emphasis on it than they were wanted. Um, well, yeah. go ahead. I think it's good to, it's just kind of good to recognize it. Cause I'm not sure people who haven't been traumatized appreciate how it feels to li- relive that kind of experience. Well, um, and I know again. like a lot of, yeah. Cause I mean, I was reading the courage to heal and I was just like, you know, I was doing it in a group. And it's just like, I don't want to read this section because it's just, we can just skip this. I don't need to know what happened. It's too triggering. Yeah. 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 I mean, I even feel that and I haven't been sexually, you know, traumatized necessarily, but I have had some, you know, frightening experiences in my life and I, I sometimes find myself going there or here's a, real, a kind of a similar story. And I'm like, mm, nope, don't need to hear that story again. Don't need to relive that memory. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, tell us about mapping map training the brain. Yeah. Okay. So now that I've des- described some of the problems that can arise in the brain in response to stress and trauma, um, let me tell you a little bit about what I've been trying to do to help people, primarily women, but it's anyone can really do it. I've just been mostly focused on, on women um, and who had trauma. So as I mentioned, I had done these studies, you know, really now a couple of decades ago, showing that the brain makes these new neurons. And one of the things that we discovered was that these neurons could be rescued from death. They could be, you know, induced to survive longer if there was some kind of mental training going on. Um, and then another lab had determined that you could make more of these neurons with, uh, with exercise, primarily aerobic exercise, meaning exercise that requires oxygen, that gets, exercise that gets the heart rate up, and delivers lots of oxygen to the brain. You know, when your heart is beating fast, you provide more oxygen to your brain from the heart, and then that, in turn, makes a lot of changes in the brain, one of which is generating more of these neurons. So I had this idea. um, Maybe I could kind of combine these two responses together in some kind of it's not, really, it's not a therapy per se. I mean, I call it a brain fitness program because it's not therapy. It, it is really something that anyone can do with, even without a therapist. Um, and it's called MAP training. So MAP stands for mental and physical. So it combines mental training with physical training. So when I was trying to make up this program, thinking about how to do it. 
I came upon meditation and I really hadn't meditated before in my life. I didn't even really know that much about it, but I knew it was hard. You know, I had read enough and knew enough to know like hmm, meditation sounds really challenging to do. And so I started doing it and I realized, yeah, <laughs> it's really hard. Um, but it's also really interesting, I find, to listen to your own thoughts, as disturbing as they can be at times. And it was definitely a learning experience. You know, I wanted whatever I chose to be something that you could always be learning from. And I do feel like meditation is one of those uh, practices, you know, that's why they call it a practice, because... Every single time you do it, you're like, wow, I think I learned something new about myself. Good and bad. <laughs> but you just kind of learn to like, wow, I have all these thoughts and I keep thinking that thought. And huh, why am I thinking that thought again? And well, why am I worrying so much about the future when it, you know, I can't possibly know everything about it. So anyway, I think of it as a form of mental training. And so, so map training is 30 minutes of meditation. We do sitting meditation, the first part. So just sitting in silence. I don't use guided meditation because I, I feel like guided meditation sometimes is more about the person who's guiding you than about yourself. And I feel like sitting in silence with your own thoughts is, you know, a really good way to to know your own brain, to get to know your own brain. Um, then there's 10 minutes of slow walking meditation. So slow walking meditation is similar in concept to sitting meditation, focusing on your breath, but we focus on our feet. So we walk really slowly in a circle and um, kind of keep your attention in your feet. When your mind starts to wander off, you bring it back to your feet. And then after the slow walking meditation, which is just 10 minutes, then we engage in 30 minutes of aerobic exercise. And that's, that can be done anyway. I mean, I have a, a dance exercise. I don't like to call it dance necessarily, but like aerobic movements to music. <laughs> it's more like it. Um, that I like to do and that I have used in, in a lot of my studies and I'm even doing, have some videos now using that. But you can do any kind of aerobic exercise. You could run, you could spin on a spinning machine, swim, anything as long as it gets your heart rate up above about 100 beats. So probably enough to be... Fair enough. Bit. Yeah. And that's, that's the program. It's, you know, it's one hour. So the meditation, the mental training is followed immediately by this physical training. And then we have done numerous studies out in the world to show that it actually helps people. Um, I did a study with people who were clinically depressed. Um, I did a study with people who, women who'd had sexual violence in their life. Um, I did a study with medical students who were very stressed out. Um, I did a study with women who have HIV living in Newark and have lots of trauma because of that experience. Um, anyway, I've just done quite a few studies. I did, oh, I did a study during COVID with teachers who obviously were very traumatized and stressed out by the pandemic. And in all these cases, all these studies, um, we found that people are just doing it like once or twice a week for six weeks. They're less depressed. They're less they ruminate less. They have less traumatic thoughts. They're more optimistic. They feel better about who they are. Um, their brains obviously change. So we've documented uh, changes in brain activity. And uh, yeah, so that's that's okay. map train my brain. Okay. Um, and tell us how that too. All right. I think that's it. Thanks for listening. Rachel and Recovery will be back next week at 10 a.m. Follow us on your favorite social media platform and on your favorite podcast platform. If you have any questions, reach out to Rachel and Recovery. 
thanks for listening and tune in next Thursday at 10 a.m. Thanks. Thank you.